In this special video, I will show you eight types of people we should not help you will be surprised by the last one. But before we start, I want you to pay close attention to this story as it will be very important for you to understand the great lesson of this video. Once upon a time, there was a farmer named Joe who lived in a small village. Joe was known for his kindness and was always willing to help others. One day he found a snake trapped in a snare in his field, although it was dangerous Pedro felt compassion for the snake and decided to set it free. Joe took care of the snake, feeding it and giving it a safe place to recover. However, as soon as the snake felt better, it bit Joe and slithered away. Joe hurt and surprised realized that the snake's nature was to bite no matter how much help it received. This story teaches us that some people like the snake do not change their nature. Sometimes in our desire to help, we can ignore the signs and end up getting hurt. It is crucial to know who we Help and understand that not everyone will value or appreciate our efforts. Imagine your energy is like a battery. Some people recharge it while others drain it faster than a phone with 100 apps. Open sound familiar. Well, let's explore these energy vampires and why it is crucial to recognize them before diving into the first type of person. If you find value in these videos, please subscribe and click the bell to stay updated. Let's begin. Number one, the ingrates. Have you ever met someone who seems to have a black hole instead of a heart? Those people who no matter how much you give them always want more and are never satisfied. Imagine you are at a restaurant enjoying a delicious dinner with friends. Suddenly you hear someone loudly complaining about the food, the service, even the color of the napkins. Yes, you've guessed it. It's the professional ingrate in action. But why do some people seem perpetually dissatisfied? Psychology has some interesting. Answers according to a study by the University of California, people with low self-esteem tend to be less grateful. It's like they have a filter that only lets the negative pass through blocking all the good that life offers them. Now we're not saying you should cut ties with everyone who forgets to say thank you, but it's important to recognize when someone is constantly abusing your kindness as the famous businessman Richard Branson once said, treat your employees as you want them to treat your best. Customers, we could extend this advice to all. Our relationships think of gratitude as a PL. It needs to be watered and cared for to grow. If you are constantly giving water, your time, energy, resources to a plant that never blooms, perhaps it's time to ask yourself if you're cultivating in the wrong garden, but be careful not to confuse ingratitude with constructive honesty, your friend who tells you that you have spinach in your teeth before an important date isn't an ingrate there. A Hero without a cape, the difference lies in the intention and the pattern of behavior. A fascinating study published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology revealed that people are not only happier, but also have stronger and more enduring relationships. It's as if gratitude is the invisible glue that holds our social connections together. Now, then what do we do with these people? The answer is not simple, but we can take some lessons from positive psychology. Martin Seligman. Considered the father of this branch of psychology suggests that cultivating gratitude benefits not only the receiver, but also the giver. So instead of getting frustrated with ingrates, we might see them as an opportunity to strengthen our own ability to appreciate the good in life. It's like going to the gym, but for our gratitude muscle, however, let's not confuse being grateful with being a bottomless pit. Setting healthy boundaries is, is as important as being generous as the writer Bernay. Brown once said generosity is not infinite and it isn't true generosity. If it comes from resentment, remember their lack of gratitude says more about them than it does about you. As the psychologist Carl Rogers once said, the curious paradox is that when I accept myself just as I am, then I can change. So the next time you encounter an ingrate, take a deep breath, remember your own worth and ask yourself, does this person deserve my energy? If the answer is no, it's okay to take a step back. You're not being selfish. You're practicing self care. And if you decide to continue helping do it because you genuinely want to not because you expect recognition as the philosopher Emmanuel Kant said, act in such a way that you use humanity, both in your person and in the person, person of any other, always at the same time as an end, never merely as a means. Now let's move on to the second type of person. We should not help. Number two, the lazy. Have you ever met someone who seems to have an allergy to effort those? People who always have an excuse for not doing anything as if the 
Couch were their natural habitat, and the remote control and extension of their hand welcome to the fascinating world of the lazy, those masters of the art of doing nothing who teach us valuable lessons about productivity or the lack thereof. Imagine you are in a work meeting, and you hear someone say, I couldn't finish the report because my cat ate my motivation. Yes, you've guessed it. It's the professional lazy person in action, but why do? Some people seem to have a PhD in Procras Destination Science has some interesting answers according to a study by the University of Calgary laziness might actually be an evolutionary strategy to conserve energy it's as if our caveman ancestors bequeathed us the energy saving or battery saving mode gene but in today's world where we don't need to save energy to escape predators this strategy can become counterproductive the psychologist William James once said nothing nothing is so fatiguing as the eternal hanging on of an incomplete task and he was right procrastination not only affects our productivity but also our mental health a study published in the journal of psychological science found that people who procrastinate regularly have higher levels of stress and worse health overall but all is not lost for our lazy friends as the famous physicist albert einstein once said laziness is the mother of all inventions and while he probably said it while looking for an excuse not to comb his hair, he has a point sometimes the need to avoid work can. Lead to creative and innovative solutions now then how do we identify a chronic lazy person here are some warning signs 1 the king of excuses these individuals have more excuses than a cat has lives I couldn't exercise because my plant needed me to sing to it to grow is just the tip of the iceberg to the expert and I'll do it tomorrow for them tomorrow is a magical place where all pending work accumulates spoiler alert that tomorrow never comes 3 the multitasker of lure they can watch. Netflix scroll through Instagram and complain about their work all at the same time if they put that energy into being productive they probably would have solved global warming by now for the shortcut seeker always looking for the easiest way to do things if there were an app to breathe for you they would be the first to download it five the five more minutes for them the alarm clock is just a friendly suggestion just five more minutes they say and before they know it an hour has passed now. We're not saying you should cut ties with everyone who prefers a nap over a gym session but remember surrounding ourselves with lazy people risks turning us into the sore thumb in a hand of slackers as Jim Ran entrepreneur and motivational author said you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with so choose your company wisely because you might end up being the only tooth in a mouthful of most motivational cavities now. Let's move on to the third type of person number three. The irresponsible have you ever met someone who seems to live in a world without consequences welcome to the fascinating universe of the irresponsible those experts in dodging commitments and blaming everything and everyone but themselves imagine you are on a boat and suddenly you notice there's a hole in the hull and water is starting to pour in while you and the rest of the crew are desperately trying to plug the hole and bail out the Water you see someone sitting calmly on the deck, sunbathing and saying it's not my problem I didn't make the hole that my friends is the irresponsible in their natural habitat. When we try to help someone with this behavior pattern we often find ourselves in a frustrating cycle no matter how hard we try to support them. Our help rarely results in significant progress the irresponsible avoid responsibilities and have an almost Olympic ability to blame others for their own failures if something goes wrong even if it is completely unrelated to our intervention we can end up being pointed out as the culprits this is not only unfair but can also take a significant emotional and reputational toll on those trying to help therefore it is. Essential to adopt a careful approach when dealing with people who behave this way how an effective strategy is to invite them to reflect on their actions and the consequences they entail instead of solving their problems for them we can guide them to develop self-evaluation and self-management skills neuroscientist Richard Davidson has shown that the brain is incredibly plastic capable of changing and adapting even even in adulthood so there is hope although they may need a nudge or perhaps a push the size of an elephant as Nelson Mandela once said education is the most 
powerful weapon you can use to change the world in this context education includes not only academic knowledge, but also the ability to assume responsibilities and learn from mistakes in the end dealing with irresponsible people is an ex exercise in patience and self-control. As the philosopher Bertrand Russell said, much of the world's troubles are due to the fact that the ignorant are completely sure and the intelligent are full of doubts. So the next time you find yourself dealing with a chronic. Irresponsible, take a deep breath and remember at least you have the intelligence to doubt whether you should continue helping them in summary while helping others is noble there is a limit, and that limit generally begins when the other person uses your kindness as a pillow for their laziness so instead of getting frustrated consider this as an opportunity to practice the art of the kind but firm no after all sometimes the best way to help someone is not to help them at all before moving on to. The fourth type of person, if you're enjoying the video, don't forget to like it and subscribe to the channel with the bell so you don't miss future videos. And if you enjoy this kind of content as much as I do comment, I love wisdom. Let's keep learning together and improving our lives. Number for the manipulators, this group presents a unique challenge as they are true artists in the art of manipulating the good we of others they exploit. Sincere attempts to help to satisfy their own interests with. No intention of reciprocity or genuine improvement. Imagine you are in a chess game, but your opponent has the mysterious ability to move your pieces without you noticing that's what it feels like to fall into the clutches of a skilled manipulator. But don't worry today, we will learn to recognize their tricks and defend ourselves against their cunning. But why do some people seem to have a PhD in manipulation psychology has some interesting answers according to a study conducted by Stanford. University people with narcissistic and Machiavellian traits are more likely to manipulate others. It's as if they have an internal GPS program to seek the shortest path to their own interests, no matter who they have to step on in the process. Now, we are not saying you should wear a tinfoil hat and distrust everyone, but it is important to develop a radar to detect the emotional pirates as the famous psychologist Robert. Kalini once said the best defense against manipulation is knowledge. Think of your emotional well-being as a fortress. Manipulators are like invaders trying to infiltrate your defenses. If you don't have a good security system before you know it, they will be sitting in your living room, eating your nachos and controlling the remote control of your life. So how do we identify a professional manipulator? Here are some warning signs. One, the emotional chameleon, they change their personality faster than a Teenager changes their mood. They are different with each person adapting to what they think the other wants to see to the gaslighting expert. They make you doubt your own perception of reality. Are you sure that happened that way? I think your memory is playing tricks on you. Three, the self-esteem sniper. They make seemingly innocent comments that undermine your confidence. Oh, are you going to wear that? Well, I suppose if you feel comfortable now, let's go to the fifth type of person, the perpetual critic. They have a knack for finding. Flaws in any situation or person from your choice of clothing to the way you organize your schedule. They will always have something to criticize. Identifying them can be as easy as listening to their conversations. Their comments are usually negative and destructive rather than constructive. If this sounds familiar, you might be dealing with a chronic critic. Now dealing with them can be like navigating an emotional minefield. No matter how well intentioned your efforts are, they will always Find a way to dismantle them with their sharp criticisms like blades. But why are they like this? Studies suggest that chronic critics often use critic ism as a way to establish power or control over others, or even as a way to project their own insecurities. It's as if they have special glasses that only allow them to see flaws in everything to counteract their negative impact. It is essential to maintain a balanced perspective. Don't take their criticisms personally. They often say more about themselves than about you try to steer the conversation towards positive aspects or constructive solutions. Sometimes a simple change of topic can be the best defense against their verbal darts. Remember, constructive criticism can be useful for personal growth, but chronic criticism simply erodes self esteem and undermines confidence by setting clear boundaries and maintaining a positive attitude, you can protect yourself from their negative influence while fostering a more positive and constructive environment around you. Number six, the 
Narcissists, have you ever come across someone who seems to have a mirror instead of a soul welcome to the fascinating world of the narcissists, those beings who have elevated self-love to an Olympic level imagine, trying to fill the Grand Canyon with a glass of water, that's how futile it can be to try to satisfy a narcissist's ego, but don't worry you're not alone in this journey, according to a study by Indiana University. Approximately 6% of the population has significant narcissistic traits that means you probably know one or two in your daily life, but how do we identify these admirers of themselves well? If you've ever met someone who believes the sun rises just to illuminate their face, you're probably dealing with a narcissist. These individuals have an impressive ability to turn any conversation into a monologue about their achievements, no matter how insignificant they are now dealing with a narcissist can be more exhausting than trying to teach a cat to bark, but don't despair there. Our strategies you can employ, Dr. Craig Mallon, author of Rethinking Narcissism, suggests setting clear boundaries. It's not about changing the narcissist, says Mallon, but about changing how you interact with them. An effective tactic is what psychologists call selective validation. Basically, it's like training a dog. You reinforce positive behavior and ignore the negative when the narcissist shows a glimmer of empathy. Yes, it sometimes happens. Acknowledge it, but when they start their usual self, Promotion session, don't play along. Remember, you are not obligated to be the captive audience of their one-person show. As the actress Bette Midler once said, the ego is a voracious octopus that feeds on your life. Don't let the narcissist in your life be that octopus. But be careful not to confuse healthy confidence with narcissism. The difference lies in the ability to empathize and the constant need for admiration while a self. Assured person can genuinely rejoice in others' successes a narcissist. Sees those successes as a threat to their own greatness and in short dealing with a narcissist can be a challenge but also an opportunity to strengthen your patience and compassion. And who knows you might even learn something after all as Oscar Wilde said to know yourself, observe the conduct of others. Number seven, the opportunists imagine meeting someone who always seems to be lurking, looking for any opportunity to gain something at the expense of others, regardless of the consequences this is. The opportunist, an individual who masters the art of taking advantage of others' generosity or resources, offering nothing in return except their own convenience, they may seem charming and friendly, but behind that facade lies an opportunistic attitude that can undermine trust in any relationship. Now, let's not confuse an opportunist with someone who genuinely needs help. The difference is in the pattern of behavior and... Reciprocity, as psychologist Harriet Breaker once said, opportunists are experts. At making you feel guilty when you don't meet their expectations, detecting an opportunist can be tricky, as they often hide their true intentions behind a collaborative appearance. A key sign is the lack of reciprocity. They always receive help but rarely return favors or collaborate equitably they use subtle manipulation like flattery or vague promises to get what they want without genuinely committing to contributing they are always present when there are benefits but disappear when effort or sacrifice is required on their part dealing with an opportunist involves setting clear boundaries and being aware of your own resources and personal limits it is crucial to set clear expectations from the beginning about what you are willing to offer and what you expect in return, fostering reciprocity is also key. Encourage the opportunist to contribute equitably in relationships, whether by sharing responsibilities or defining roles and expectations transparently from a psychological perspective. Opportunists reflect a combination of low empathy and high opportunism studies on human behavior indicate that certain personalities are more prone to adopt manipulative behaviors to satisfy their own interests without considering the impact on others by understanding. How to identify and manage opportunists you can protect your emotional integrity and maintain healthier and more equitable relationships. It is true that giving and receiving are fundamental in any healthy relationship, but when you realize that you are constantly giving and receiving nothing in turn, it is time to reconsider the situation investing energy and effort in people who do not value or appreciate your contribution can be exhausting and emotionally draining. It is better to channel that 
energy towards more equitable and rewarding relationships where your actions are mutually recognized and valued now let's go to our f and final type of people we should not help the envious number eight the envious imagine you just won the lottery who would you tell first before you start making a mental list let me share an interesting fact with you according to a study conducted by harvard university 70 percent of Lottery winners experience a deterioration in their personal relationships after. Their victory, the main reason is envy, but you don't need to win millions to experience the corrosive effects of envy from that promotion at work to that new relationship that has you on cloud nine. The envious are always lurking, ready to throw their venomous darts of disapproval and resentment. So what makes some people more prone to envy? Psychologist Sarah Presai in her book, The Philosophy of Envy, suggests that envy arises when we perceive a gap between what we have and what we believe we deserve. It's as if we have an internal cosmic justice counter that goes crazy when someone else gets something we think should be ours. But here's the interesting part. Envy is not necessarily bad. In fact, it can be a powerful motivator. As the famous inventor Thomas Edison once said to invent, you need a good imagination and a pile of junk substitute junk for envy. And you have a recipe for success or disaster, depending on how you hand it. The key lies in how we respond to envy, both ours and others. And Here's where one of the most counterintuitive but effective tips comes into play. Keep your successes and plans secret. Yes, you heard right in an era where it seems that if you don't share it on social media, it didn't happen. I'm suggesting you do exactly the opposite. Why? Well, let me share a secret with you. Intentional irony. When you share your plans prematurely, your brain releases dopamine, the same chemical released when you actually achieve the goal. This can lead you to feel a false sense of Accomplishment reducing your motivation to move forward. Don't take my word for it. Science says so. A study published in the journal Psychological Science found that people who kept their goals secret were 70% more likely to achieve them than those who shared them widely. It's as if the universe has a twisted sense of humor. The more you talk about your dreams, the less likely they are to come true. But there's more when you share your plans. Your not only dealing with your own psychology, but also with that of others. And this is where our envious friends come into play. As writer Gore Vidal once said, every time a friend succeeds, I die a little now. Multiply that by every person you tell your PL to, and you'll have an idea of the amount of negative energy you might be attracting without realizing it. So what do we do? Do we become hermits and keep all our achievements to ourselves? Not exactly the key is to be selective as Entrepreneur Richard Branson once said, trust your instincts, be selective about who you share your dreams with. Think of your dreams and plans as a secret recipe. You wouldn't give it to just anyone, right? Only to those people you trust completely. Those you know will not only not reveal it, but will help you improve it. And here's the trick. When you finally decide to share your plans or successes, do it in a way that inspires rather than provokes envy. Instead of saying, I just got an amazing promotion, try saying I'm Excited about this new challenge at work, the difference may seem subtle, but the impact on how others perceive your news can be enormous. Now let's go back to our envious friends for a moment. How do we identify them? Well, here are some warning signs. One, the reluctant praiser, their congratulations sound more forced than a bore a tea at a vegan dinner. Two, the professional minimizer, no matter how big your achievement is for them, it will always be luck or not a big deal. Three, the compulsive. Competitor, your success is just an excuse for them to tell you how. They did it better, faster, or cheaper for the cough saba. They cheer you on in public, but privately do everything they can to derail your plans. Five, the information collector. They always want to know more details, not out of genuine interest, but to find flaws or a copy you recognizing these patterns is the first step to protecting yourself. The second is developing what I call an oyster mindset. Do you know how oysters produce pearls by? taking an irritant and turning it into something beautiful in the same way you can take others envy and use it as motivation to keep growing and improving remember your value does not diminish because of others achievement nor does it increase because of their failures as writer mark twain once said comparison is the thief of joy focus on your own path your own goals and your own growth envy is often a reflection of others insecurity as elena roosevelt once said no one can make you feel inferior without your consent so the next time you feel the envious 
Gaze of someone smile not because you enjoy their discomfort, but because you have found a sign that you are on the right track track in summary being selective about who you share your successes and plans with is not about being selfish or arrogant. It's about protecting your energy, maintaining your motivation, and yes, also about protecting yourself from toxic envy as philosopher Bertrand Russell once said, don't worry about what others think. Of you, they care much less than you imagine, so the... Next time you have big news or an exciting plan, take a deep breath smile to yourself and keep it as a treasure share it only with those you know will genuinely be happy for you and remember the best success is the one that does not need to be announced let your achievements speak for themselves after all actions always speak louder than words and definitely attract less envy if you've made it this far be sure to leave your mark down here in the comments by writing peaceful mind if you found these insights valuable make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more wisdom. And before you go here's something extraordinary I want to share with you NASA scientists have developed a revolutionary 7 minute audio called Genius Wave that helps unlock your brain's full potential imagine attracting success and happiness effortlessly our subscriber Nelson did just that he rekindled his relationship and landed a promotion. At work using this amazing tool to discover how you can transform. Your life too. Click the link in the description below. Don't miss out on this opportunity.